Hello, everyone. We'll give just a minute or so for people to file in and then we'll get started. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you all for joining us and good afternoon and good morning for people on the on, out west with me. Um, we're excited to present this timely webinar, Red, White and Black Reflections on How Black Struggle Shaped White America, sponsored by the ABA Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. This panel is one of many in a series of rapid resp response webinars. Uh, we're actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues. This is the ABA. So please visit at AmericanBar.org backslash CRSJ for updates on future programs. I'm today's moderator, JT Rohn, and I'm Assistant Professor of African American Studies in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University, where I also lead the Institute for Humanities Research Black Ecologies Initiative. Um, because I'm at ASU, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the ancestral lands of the indigenous Akamel Odom and Peeposh nations, whose care and keeping of these unceded territories uh, preceded the onslaught of colonization. Um, today's panelists is a remarkable group of people, and I'm very excited for this conversation. Um, I'll just uh, give their brief bios and I'll allow them to plug, plug their own work, et cetera, when they give their remarks. Um, First, we have Dr. Martha Jones, Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor <clears throat> and Professor of History at Johns Hopkins, um, Kevin Brown, Richard S. Melvin, Professor of Law, Indiana University, Bloomington Morrow School of Law, Dr. T.J. Davis, Emeritus Professor here at ASU, um, and unfortunately, Derricka Purnell uh, was unable to join us. Um, <clears throat> During just a, br a brief housekeeping note and then a small provocation before I hand over uh, the mic to Dr. Jones. Um, during today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A function and not the chat function. Um, if you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address questions at the end of the program. Um, and we'll, briefly, and we'll be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely within your networks. Um, and as I said before, I'm really excited about today's um, panelists. Um, and, I'm, I'm coming from FAO uh, and we weren't. I'm really excited about today's panelists remarks um, and I'm provoked by the current moment. And I wanna raise just a brief provocation that I don't expect the panelists to respond to directly. Um, but that may be perhaps can serve as a touching point. Um, what is or would meaningful citizenship look like in the context in a, in a context in which as Ida lays bare, we face the deterioration through neglect of the primary in infrastructures of living, mass vulnerability to climate calamity at the scales of neighborhoods and regions, and a state that continues to hemorrhage 1300 or more people per day to COVID while also um, holding tightly critical supplies of vaccines from the world's majority. What does it mean in the face of ongoing logics of lynching? Very much alive as my colleague, Dr. Ursula Orr argues in her recent work, Lynching, Violence, Rhetoric, and American Identity. Um, as Martha Stunning Vanguard reminds, Black women's work to democratize us, our society was and is dangerous work, the cordon of trouble. Civil rights and Black power were also eras of significant transformation in formal and practice citizenships. And they also, the actors there also courted danger simply by acting within a social, political, and economic order dependent on the management of Black life, often in truly unlivable circumstances. What do we do in relation to a constitution that is a fallible document given, given its context 
uh, given the context of its construction and the vastly different circumstances of a society that produced it and, the one, con and one continuing to use it. Um, these histories haunt, I think, this panel, the panel is drawn together. These histories haunt and inhabit the present. If history isn't prescriptive necessarily, are there parallels on which we might draw? And what are the day-to-day -day relationships that these histories and present activities mirror to us? What can we, what can we all do, right? So I, I'm gonna turn it over um, to Dr. Martha Jones to um, just give us some of the rich history that um, her work has shown. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much uh, to the American Bar Association, the Civil Rights and Social Justice section. Um, and thank you to you, Dr. Roan, for um, asking, I think, the questions we should be precisely asking ourselves um, as um, historians, um, as scholars, as thinkers, um, as community members, and more, um, I hope, um, a small part of my work um, begins to speak to your important question. And I will try and answer it um, by saying that um, my subject today, um, which is voting rights, um, has always um, necessarily um, responded, not always in laudable ways, but has always responded right, to conditions, to demands, to imperatives um, that emanate from the ground, if you will. Um, and that one of the challenges um, we face is precisely how, um, if at all, our democracy um, and that pillar of our democracy, which is voting rights, um, will adapt, will respond, um, will remain um, not only vital, but legitimate um, in the face of um, extraordinary challenges um, that keep already too many Americans from the polls and threaten um, the capacity of many, many others to cast their ballots. Um, today, I want to just briefly suggest that when we look back over the course of U.S. history, um, it is not difficult to um, take away one lesson. And that is in every era in our national history, um, voting rights and voter suppression um, have been companion projects. Um, that there is no um, golden age of voting rights in the United States. Um, we are learning in real time in the 21st century that there is no um, arc of progress um, that is taking us closer and closer to a perfect union on voting rights here as we are witnessing um, new measures of voter suppression emerge um, as we speak. Um, when we look back, be it in the, um, the earliest generations, the revolutionary generations, when um, the word white was inserted into many, many state laws and constitutions as a qualification for voting rights, if we look at the mid 19th century when um, uh, unproperty white men um, were welcomed into the body politic for the first time in large numbers, um, we also appreciate that African-American men in states like New York and Philadelphia and Pennsylvania um, were being disenfranchised at the very, um, at the very same moment. Um, my example today um, comes from the early 20th century um, it draws on um, uh, my most recent book, um, thanks to Dr. Roan for having taken time with it this week, um, Vanguard, How Black Women uh, Broke Barriers, uh, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, which is a 200-year look at African-American women's political history um, from the early uh, 19th century through the early 21st. Um, but I want to hone in for a few minutes on that moment in 1920, um, ratification of the 19th Amendment, the so-called Women's Suffrage Amendment. Um, and likely at some point you've encountered characterizations of that moment. American women win the right to vote. American women are guaranteed the right to vote. Um, women's votes become protected by the Constitution. 
um, and more is often what is said about this moment. Um, but those simple characterizations elide um, the open secret of the 19th Amendment, which is that um, in the road to its ratification, um, in the um, implementation of the amendment itself in 1920 and beyond, um, no one um, knew, no one expected that the amendment would interfere with the ongoing capacity of individual states, and especially Southern states. Nothing in the amendment would suppress state level capacities to suppress the votes of black women much in the ways that those women's fathers and sons and husbands and more, um, the way black men's votes had been suppressed since the 1890s. Um, nothing in the 19th Amendment promised to curb the violence and intimidation um, that waited for black women um, during registration season in 1920. And when black women looked across the landscape, it was not true that half of the American populace had been enfranchised in one grand gesture. Um, what they saw was an uneven patchwork where black women voted in states like California and Illinois and New York, um, but across the American South in far too many places, they remained disenfranchised. Vanguard is not a book that could end in 1920 because to understand black women's politics we have to appreciate how out of the disappointments of the 19th Amendment, Black women link arms with Black men to build a new movement for voting rights in the United States. Um, that is a longer story that takes us to 1965 and passage in that year of the Voting Rights Act. Um, but by doing the political work in the trenches, um, by engaging in the legal campaign led by the NAACP and by building the modern civil rights revolution, African-American women not only transform the voting rights landscape for themselves in this country, um, they make voting rights a national concern, a federal concern, and they do so by holding up what is in their view, some of this nation's best ideals. Um, these are women who speak in human rights terms, who decry both racism and sexism, and for a very long time, um, labor alone to insist upon values that should animate every election day um, that I think we still are striving toward even in the 21st century. Um, so I'll stop there and say thank you again for having me, and I very much look forward to the discussion. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Rome, for that introduction, and thank Ali Kilsgaard and Lakshmi Gopal for helping organize this event and of course the American Bar Association Civil Rights and Social Justice section. Um, I'm gonna try to stick towards the subject of how the black struggle helps to shape white America. And my remarks are gonna center primarily upon that impact in terms of the rights of Americans, mostly obtained through the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s and beyond. However, so many of those rights centered upon the interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. I will therefore spend much time focusing on the 14th Amendment, and the 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution because of the struggle of Black people for their freedom. Uh, as a result, I will also, it also means that I must focus on the struggle of Black people for their own liberation from slavery. Now, the Equal Protection Clause is part of the 14th Amendment, which was passed in Congress in June of 1866 in the aftermath of the Civil War. It was added to the Constitution in 1868. The Equal Protection Clause is the clause used to strike down school segregation and to prevent intentional racial discrimination by public authorities. But it applies to all forms of discrimination based on hereditary characteristics. 
Thus, when women talk about their constitutional right to be discriminated against, when you hear Hispanics and Asians talk about their constitutional rights not to be discriminated against, when you hear whites talk about their constitutional rights not to be discriminated against, when you hear gays and lesbians talk about their constitutional right not to be discriminated against, when you hear those who are physically challenged talk about their constitutional rights not to be discriminated against because of their special challenges. All of these groups are talking about their rights under the Equal Protection Clause. But the 14th Amendment includes many more rights. The 14th Amendment is without question the single most important amendment to the Constitution. This is the amendment that is used to incorporate the protections of the Bill of Rights that applied originally only to the federal government to the state governments. The original Bill of Rights added to the Constitution in 1791 was conceived as a limitation on the power of the federal governments, not the state governments. As all of us in the legal field know, the words of the First Amendment clearly state, Congress shall make no law. Let me repeat that, Congress shall make no law. Thus the expansion of our constitutional rights to limit what state governments can do occurs as a result of incorporation of the provisions of the Bill of Rights to limit the power of the states through the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Thus your rights against state governments that protect you and provide for freedom of speech, the right to an abortion, the right to same-sex marriage, the right to prevent the police from engaging in unreasonable searches and seizures, freedom to exercise your religion according to your conscience, freedom of the press, freedom from cruel and unusual punishment, the right to a speedy trial if you're accused of a crime, the right to trial by jury, the right to bear arms, the right to have an attorney present if you cannot afford one at a trial are all rights that come to you through the 14th Amendment. But this only tells you what the 14th Amendment does. It does not tell you why it was added to the Constitution. It was added as a result of the struggles of the Black community that requires us to go back to the Civil War. And in doing so, we have to go back to the words of Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant. Both of them publicly repeated that without Black troops, they could not have won the war. In August of 19, 1864, Lincoln expressed this view in moving words, observing that over 130,000 Blacks were fighting to preserve the Union at that point, he said that they were motivated by the strongest motive, the promise of freedom. There have been men who proposed to me to return to slavery the Black warriors. I would be damned in time and in eternity for doing so. The world shall know that I will keep my faith to friends and enemies come what will. Indeed, the United States Supreme Court talking about the 14th Amendment in its first decision interpreting its purpose in 1873 opinion stated, we repeat then in the light of this recapitulation of events almost too recent to be called history, but which are familiar to us all. On the most casual examination of the language of this amendment, no one can fail be impressed with the one pervading purpose found in it, lying at its foundation, and without which it would not even have been suggested. We mean the freedom of the slave race, the secured and firm establishment of that freedom, and the protection of the newly made free men and citizens from the oppression of those who had formerly exercised unlimited dominion over them. And if one were to look at the record of the Black troops to see why the 14th Amendment was part payoff for their struggles in the Civil War, we know that 85% of eligible Black males in the North fought in the Civil War. Some 170,000 troops, Black troops, fought for the North. Indeed, by the end of the war, while Blacks only constituted 2% of the North's population, they with their Southern brothers and sisters made up almost 13% of the Union forces and 25% of the Navy. They also constituted over 10% of the North's casualties on the battlefield. 
this is in fact truly remarkable given the fact that the union took so long to embrace him as a fighting force. So let me try to convey the significance of Lincoln and Grant's candid acknowledgement of the central role of black troops in the Civil War, thus their central role in the 14th Amendment. What they meant by their statements of how significant the black troops involvement in the Civil War were, was that when government of the people, by the people, and for the people was about to perish, it was the Black people who saved the Union. And thus the struggle of Blacks has not only been the source of major rights that all Americans, including white ones, enjoy, our struggle was one that helped bind the Union itself together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Well, like my fellow panelists, I thank the American Bar Association Civil Rights and Social Justice Section uh, for having this panel and for inviting me. Uh, I thank my fellow panelists uh, for pointing to the specific historical moments of the 1920s, 1960s, and 1970s. Um, I'll say at the start that, like Professor Brown, uh, my argument really is about uh, blacks being the bottom in regard to recognition of rights that have pushed all other rights up. We, we for some time, have heard about uh, <laughs> a rising tide, right? Blacks have been that rising tide. And so the black and white reality of the United States of America is hardly new. I've always laughed at uh, that line in the Kerner Commission report that talked about the nation tending toward <laughs> two nations, one black and one white. I was wondering where those folks had been uh, throughout US history. Um, the black white reality is a long historical reality. It existed before the nation's colonial founding. I was asked to offer broad historical perspective on blacks position and role in the US constitutional project. In the brief time available here, I applied broad brushstrokes on a canvas stretched taut by us versus them pathology, a pathology fixed on the other. For the US Constitution reflects the fact that the nation arose on a foundation of us and them, of inclusion and exclusion. The indigenous peoples collapsed under the terms Native American or American Indians and the forced immigrants from ancestral Africa, those commonly called Negroes or Blacks, who became African Americans, were the primary excluded others. They were the them, whom whites separated, excluded, denigrated, and disparaged. The Constitution's directed count of its us of those whom it deemed we the people of the United States of America in Article I excluded Indians not taxed and referenced blacks as other persons. Indians became the external other, driven beyond the settled US borders or destroyed as those settled borders expanded from Atlantic to Pacific. They were the other white Americans framed to reflect their self-serving definition of civilization. Blacks became the internal other, forced to labor within the settled borders of the United States, spreading with settlements south and west, but present also north and east. They were the other white Americans framed to reflect their self-serving definition of freedom. Blacks had been those that whites have used to provide their own self-identification and self-image. As blacks became the internal other forced to labor, they were those that provided a contrast in who wanted to be black, who would identify themselves as, as black. Immigrants coming in wanted immediately to separate themselves from blacks so that they could be, right, the us, not the them, so that they could be the we, 
not the other. So white Americans early came to see themselves as civilized in contrast to American Indians and as free in contrast to African Americans. As the internal other, blacks have been more than an image of reflection or an image in the white mind. They were early the vision and voice of a conscience struggling with the hypocrisy of white Americans, public policies and practices. Blacks stood conspicuously to mock and call for an accounting of whites duplicity and insincerity in espousing among truths said to be held as self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If American Negro slavery did not put the lie to those principles and practices, I mean, what would? So from the beginning of the US Constitution ratified in 1788, Blacks by their presence and persistent protests pointed to the inadequacies of the nation's principles and practices and called for reforms in order to form a more perfect union. And they stood not only for themselves, I reiterate there the points that Professor Brown made, they stood not only for themselves, right? For the principles that they protested work for all others, for all non-whites, for all those who were not white, but who transitioned to being white. I mean, look at the work of various scholars, Ira Castleton, uh, Haney Lopez, and others who talked about those who came in, Irish not being white to start, but moving to be white, because again, no one wanted to be black because black was understood as the other side, as the excluded side. So blacks have been the tip of the spear, if you like, moving against the exclusion imposed by white, patriarchal, masculinist, heterosexual supremacy. So again, that litany that uh, Professor Brown offered us is one that we need to take account of. Blacks challenged the, rest the restriction white, as Professor Jones uh, pointed out. And so in the nation's naturalization laws, right, it was African-Americans who were the first to move the nation's standard from a white standard, right? Only whites could be naturalized uh, up through the 1860s. It was blacks and their presence and their push who moved to have written into law birthright citizenship based on being born in the United States, regardless of parentage, right? a thing now very much at issue. You know, people wanna take away birthright citizenship, saying that birthright citizenship should only flow regarding the legal status of the parents of the child. You know, it was the black challenge that produced the first restrictions on states power to deny or bridge the right to vote. I mean, look at uh, what Professor Jones was pointing to in terms of the the 19th Amendment, it's based on the 15th Amendment, right? Take out the words race or previous condition of servitude and substitute there the word sex. And in regard to the powerful questions that Professor Rohn offered at the start, I mean, what we the people can do, what citizenship means in my mind in the 21st century, goes beyond voting. Voting is not the beginning and end of our citizenship or our participation. It's one of the elements of our citizenship and our participation. And more than that, we need to think of citizenship in the 21st century as beyond national borders. I mean, the climate crisis is not a climate, a crisis that's confined as terrible as it is in the United States with the wildfires, the droughts, the floods, the rest, these are worldwide elements that we, the people 
of the world need to take account of. And in that regard, as we look at Blacks, their protest, their place and position in the US constitutional framework, we need to think of them also as pushing not so much for civil rights, but for human rights. And there I give a nod to black women because the fact of the matter is that so many black men, so many black male leaders over the years have been caught up in the cult of masculinity. And we can even go to the famed March on Washington whose anniversary we, we had recently where black women were essentially excluded from the podium and the program. But black women have always been the ones who are talking about the rights of humanity. And so Professor Rohn, in regard to the questions that you raised, I think it behooves us in answering your question to understand our obligations as members of the human community. Thank you. Um, thank you all for such powerful remarks. Um, just a reminder to um, our audience to, you know, submit questions um, and to join us in conversation through the Q and A function. Um, thank. I, I just I want to dive um, with um, deeper in terms of the kinds of histories that you all are referencing. Um, and particularly, you know, because you ended here, Dr. Davis, and you started there, Dr. Jones, um, but I invite all the panelists um, to maybe share a kind of history of an actor or someone in, in these kinds of, you know, in the history of voting and other kinds of um, uh, concerns around citizenship. Um, could you just kind of provide us with a vignette just quickly or something from your research that um, that would be meaningful as we await audience questions. Well, I, I would start there, Professor Rohn, by pointing to Sojourner Truth, right? Here we have a, a Black woman um, born in New York, um, born in a place that was a colony before the English came. She's born among um, a remnant, if you like, Dutch colonial community. Um, she liberates herself. She liberates herself not only through the self-invention process that we think of as American, as typically American, she renames herself. And she goes out on the stump to tell, well, I, before that, um, when we talk about the rights of parents and children, so Journey Truth, again, is an illustration of how Blacks played a role in terms of while she was able to free herself to start, her children had been taken from her and she went to court to argue and win custody of her children uh, over time. She goes out and for uh, about 40 years or so, she persistently makes the argument that, hey, I'm a woman, I'm a human being, and as a, a human being, I deserve the same rights as other human beings. Being human is not about being male or female. It's not about anything other than how we should behave one toward another. She challenged Americans in a variety of ways in regard to what they professed in terms of their religion. I mean, she was certainly not the first nor the last to ask if you're truly Christian, <laughs> have you in fact read the book on which your religion is based and do you practice those principles? I mean, where, where is your brotherhood and in saying that, she says, you know, it's brotherhood and sisterhood. It's Paul writing his epistles to brothers and sisters. And so, I mean, with Sojourner Truth, Harriet Trump, you know, yes, aren't I a woman? And so on the one hand, um, 
while we had this, this cult of domesticity during the early 19th century, where women were being elevated, as Professor Jones pointed out in regard to the 19th Amendment, you know, women getting the right to vote for many meant white women getting the right to vote. The cult of domesticity where women were being elevated at the same times as they were being restricted meant that white women would be elevated. And so Journey Truth was there to say, <laughs> no, no. See, you, you have to do away with these artificial distinctions that are based on categories such as sex or race or religion. Um, I'd invite the other panelists to jump in if you'd like, or we can move on to other questions. Sure, I'd be happy to come in, Dr. Roan. Um, I'd like to hold up um, a set of um, figures from um, the 1820s, um, men who organized in the city of Baltimore in Maryland under the auspices of what they call the Legal Rights Association. Um, three men, uh, James Deaver, William Watkins, and um, Hezekiah Grice. Um, these men um, were um, free black men living in the city of Baltimore in a slaveholding state um, who were um, part of the early, what we term today, the colored convention movement. Um, an African-American political movement that grows up um, independently um, in the face of exclusion and discrimination within the white political parties and um, in the face of exclusion from the state house. Um, these are men, are men who are battling against um, what were then called black laws um, that limited um, nearly every aspect of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and they were struggling against colonization um, the largest, most widespread political movement of the early 19th century, a movement that looked to remove um, formerly enslaved people, free black Americans from the United States to places like um, Liberia. They organized into the Equal Rights Association because they believe that by the terms of the constitution, they should be regarded as citizens of the United States. Um, they are, um, natural born citizens, as they put it, um, like the president of the United States must be. And they see in the constitution, no color line that would suggest otherwise. Um, and their work in the 1820s is to secure legal opinions um, and to build the case for their citizenship. Um, these are not men who will live long enough um, to see that project through, um, but they set into motion um, what becomes a growing political movement among Black Americans, um, yes, to combat and to um, end enslavement in the United States, but also to claim um, the privileges and the rights associated with citizenship, including that right to remain in the country and not be forcibly removed by colonization. Um, one endpoint for their story is 1870. Um, we've now um, had a um, 13th Amendment, which has abolished slavery. We've got a 14th Amendment, which has made them birthright citizens, that claim that they had leveled um, decades before. Um, and finally, a 15th Amendment um, that men from Baltimore, along with others from across the country, had advocated for um, in Washington in 1869 during that year's National Colored Convention. Um, Baltimore is the home for the national celebration of the ratification of the 15th Amendment. Um, and it is in many ways um, a high point for um, generations of black activists, men and some women um, who have been pressing not only for freedom, um, but for their standing as full citizens of the United States. Um, I just got to write about some of them for um, the African-American Intellectual History Society in an essay um, in a round table um, that organization did um, on the subject of contested citizenship. Um, and as we know, of course, coming out of the 15th Amendment, um, the um, hurdles um, will continue to be placed in front of Black Americans, um, but it certainly is a high point um, for men who had struggled um, through the pre-Civil War years. 
Professor Brown, is there something that you yeah. know? Let that me, I, I, I'll sort of change the subject a little bit and respond to the question about how can we spread the message more broadly the, about that the expansion of American rights are based on the fight of rights for by African Americans. Um, and I'm actually going to globalize that. Um, you know, this we were to talk about how Black struggle shapes white America. But the Black struggle has had a tremendous international impact. Uh, I spend most of my research now working with the 300 million people who were formerly referred to as, as outcasts or untouchables in India. They call themselves Dalits. They use the term Dalits because it comes from the Dalit Panthers. The Dalit Panthers were a group formed in the 1970s. Um, and, and once again, when you think about untouchables, in some sense, they very well may be the most oppressed people in all of human history. But in the 1970s, they created a group, group called the Dalit Panthers, who believe in their equality by any means necessary. That was a group that was inspired by the Black Panther Party, a point that they made. So they used the word Dalit that comes from a group inspired by the Black Panther Party to call themselves. And they will go on, they will embrace what they call Dalit capitalism, inspired by Black capitalism here in the US. They will create a Dalit Lives Matters movement, I have been at some of their rallies where they will use the iconic civil rights song, we shall overcome in their rallies. And that's just India. If I were thinking about South Africa, I don't think there's any real serious question that South Africa would have been able, would not have been able to overthrow apartheid had it not been for assistance as well as intellectual assistance from the African-American struggle the Black consciousness movement in South Africa that was critical for them to overthrow apartheid was quote from one of the Black consciousness founders in South Africa imported lock, stock and barrel from the African-Americans. And even Stephen Biko, the father of Black, Black consciousness in South Africa will be accused of plagiarizing Stokely Carmichael's book, Soul on Ice, where the legislature in South Africa shows page after page after page of Stephen Biko's book being drawn directly from Soul on Ice. Uh, Palestine, the Palestinians created the Palestinian Panther Party in the 1950s or 1960s. And indeed, even in Ireland, Ireland created a Panther Party. Um, the work that African Americans did in terms of preventing the Dutch from reimposing their colonialism in Indonesia is another thing that people don't talk about. So I, I guess my point is, not only have we as African Americans helped to shape the United States and have broadened rights for everyone here, we've done the same thing globally. And to one of the questions that was asked about whether there is a, a black white divide elsewhere in the world. I mean, Professor Brown has, has spoken to that. And the answer is, yeah, <laughs> there's South Africa, but uh, look at the United Kingdom. You know, one of the books you might look at is there ain't no black in the union, Jack. Well, <laughs> the, the us versus them pathology that I spoke of at the top of my remarks persists throughout the world. And to this question of how do we get beyond American rights, the answer is human rights. I mean, human rights are, are universal. And I think that one of the things there that we Americans might look at is the false sense of exceptionalism that too often pervades our thinking and our history. It's as if uh, things that happen elsewhere happen elsewhere. And don't immediately resonate for us. And unfortunately, I see that so often as I look at the daily newscast. So you, you have an event that occurs and you can pick your place around the world. And a thousand locals die in the event. And the lead American story is two Americans were killed. Now, 
I understand as a former journalist, the importance of localism. But the point is that too often, the US sense of exceptionalism diminishes the humanity of the rest of the world. And so back to my remarks, uh, reaching to you, Professor Rohn, in your questions about climate change, we have global challenges to face. And we face those global challenges, not as Americans or uh, Brits or Europeans or Asians, we face those challenges as humans because it's humanity, right? It's humanity that is at stake here, both in the sense of political rights and in the sense of simple existence. I wanted to raise in this, raise a question just kind of, you know, based on the histories that you all are talking through, not only, you know, this rich circuitry between um, the kind of US um, nation state context and the kind of it, international, you know, of course the Panthers also being inspired by anti-colonial organization um, globally and there being a circuit there between different modes of engagement. What are these kinds of, um, you know, and, and, you know, and what you also discuss, um, Professor Jones about Baltimore and that very, you know, that very sort of specific um, trajectory into the 1870s. What do these tell us, I guess, about, um, you know, how the narrative of legal history or, um, you know, the, how we can change the, the narrative of legal history in relation to black contributions um, to the development of American legal principles? Um, and what would, what would that kind of change add to our discussions and understandings of constitutional law? I think that's a great question. And, um, you know, one of the things I tried to um, accomplish in um, my 2018 book, Birthright Citizens, um, was to um, demonstrate the degree to which the debates that Black Americans are engaged in in the U.S. are really hemispheric debates. Um, I use a character, a man named George Hackett, um, who does a stint, a Pacific tour um, aboard the USS Constitution in the 1830s. Um, Hackett visits Veracruz in Mexico and Havana in Cuba, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil um, and beyond. And from his vantage point, um, we appreciate um, that the long story of Black Americans and their critical thinking about the Constitution um, is one that is necessarily must be framed, um, certainly in hemispheric terms in my story, um, which is to say that when we then probe into black newspapers of the period, what we find are um, reports and commentary and more um, that reflect that sophisticated thinking, comparative thinking um, about constitutional um, systems, um, about how, for example, in Brazil, black, Ameri black men um, and women are citizens, um, even as they are not in the United States, despite being free. Um, this kind of comparative thinking um, very much fuels what Black Americans then bring to the table in debates over the Constitution, um, its meaning, um, its amendment, and a great deal, um, a great deal more. Um, I, I've done a lot of work with different groups who are struggling for their own liberation within their particular country. Um, and, and I would say that certainly for me, what I have learned is that uh, oppression and subordination tends to be local, uh, that it depends upon a particular group's history at a particular time. And that therefore it's not as fungible, but that groups struggling against subordination and oppression can learn a tremendous amount from each other. Uh, we can study, for example, what our brothers and sisters in South Africa do and then adapt that to our circumstance or situation. And it's the same as what I've seen with other groups who've looked at the African-American situation, is they look at our situation, but to figure out how can they adapt what we have done to fit the particular needs of their society. 
So I'm, I'm a little less optimistic about one set of rights being applied to everyone, because it does seem to me that liberation struggles really are our local struggles and depend upon certain um, facts and history that is relevant to that particular location. To that, Professor Brown, what I would say is that I agree with you in regard to uh, the politics. The politics are local. The power arrangements and structures are local. But I would argue that the principles are universal. And that when you talk about our sharing, I think that's really what, what you're talking about, because we're talking about strategies and tactics to advance certain principles, the recognition of each other, the recognition of the quality of each other, the recognition of the equality of, of each other. Um, and so, I mean, increasingly, we're living in a global world. I'm, when Professor Brown, when you were talking about the, the, the local struggles, I was thinking about the fact that um, these days you can catch social media from your Dalit community or Afghan women who are protesting at this moment, right? And so um, it, more than ever, I would push the idea that we need to broaden our consciousness about <laughs> who our neighbors are and about how what's going on around the world affects us. Um, it, again, I go back to the fact that, that too often um, I read and hear comments as if we're back in those days when Americans thought that they had these two oceans on each side and that was sort of some sort of insulation or protection and we didn't have to be concerned. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, you know, intervention was ever the right solution, but internationalism is a reality. And the degree to which America does things like pull out of the Paris Climate <laughs> Agreement affects not just Americans, but everyone uh, around the world. Um, and before I close, I want to jump on the question about, uh, there was a, a Q and A about, uh, the black church used to be the, the center for, uh, for movement. There's no way to underestimate the importance of the black church in the institutional development of the African-American community of African-American protest of policy and all the rest of that. As Professor Jones was pointing out, the church though was not the only institution that was operating. Certainly the position of the black church in 21st century America is not what it used to be. But part of that is because there are so many other outlets. And so the point is that we need to be, in my view, less concerned about a single element, a single organization, a single push, and seeing what we can do. It's not by any means necessary, it's by every means necessary. And to that point, I would say that from the students I've addressed over the last 50 years, I have pressed the notion that we need to stop thinking about we shall overcome being some moment in time, as if it's some magic moment. When we reach that point, everything is clear and smooth. The point is that our human existence is a process of continual struggle. I wanna ask about, um, as we head into closing out, I wanna add, because um, Derricka Purnell is not here, um, her perspective on abolition politics has not kind of been centered, but I wanna invoke that in this space. How do, how do we jive these, these histories um, that we're talking about with the kind of demands of, um, of the contemporary abolition movement. And that's centering prisons and policing in the kind of current formations. But as we know from, you know, very high profile work um, by people like Ruthie Gilmore in the New York Times and other spaces that abolition is a complex um, demand, right? That it, that it is 
it is literally the kind of demand for the total reimagining of our social order. So how do how do we how do those histories connect with or disconnect from the kind of demand for abolition? Um, I just want to um, close with that that question, um, if if the panelists will indulge. I'm happy to jump in and, and I hope my comments are on point for you, Dr. Roan. Um, you know, there's a moment in the 1850s, um, a bleak moment for black Americans, um, a new uh, draconian fugitive slave act has become law. Um, and now enslavers, um, their agents um, in, cooperation with federal officials are empowered to um, enter so-called free soil, Northern states that have abolished slavery um, and claim enslaved people. And it unleashes a, a wave, of, a new wave of terror um, among black Americans um, everywhere. Um, in the wake of this, um, there are those among black Americans who um, inaugurate a movement that we call immigration, um, probably best remembered um, through the figure of um, the great Martin Delaney. Um, and while this is not a movement we call abolition, but it is abolition in the sense of abdication, right? These are black Americans um, who organize themselves um, around the insight um, that the nation is irredeemable. Right, that the nation, um, the United States um, cannot be purged of slavery, cannot be purged of anti-Black racism, will never, has not the capacity, the intention, the vision, the desire to, um, to uh, acquiesce finally, right, to the demands that Black Americans have made for now um, more than half a century. Um, and I see that as one origin point for what undergirds an abolition movement even in the 21st century um, is that sense that um, the degradations, um, the inequalities, the violence, um, structural and as it is practiced every day um, cannot be eradicated um, from the systems um, in which that we inhabit. Um, and while there was not a call quite for the abolition of the US um, to leave the US, to abandon the US for Africa, for Canada, for the Caribbean, um, was to me um, a manifestation of that, um, that sentiment that now um, continues to echo in the 21st century. Um, I, I, I'll keep my comment really short because I, I, I see the time here. Um, I think that's a fascinating question and certainly, and that is the notion of thinking about abolition and thinking about our prison population today. And, and one of the things that has really struck me is that one of the things undergridding the desire to reduce the prison population is just simply the cost. It's not that this is a motivation out of uh, humanitarian concerns. It's this realization that we have to continue to pay a very heavy tax burden to continue this, this system. And, and it, it may just simply be that that argument's more effective than humanitarian concerns. And if one is pragmatic, perhaps effective arguments are more important. It's interesting that you put it that way, Professor Brown. Uh, much of my early work <laughs> asked that very question about who pays. If we go back and we talk about the thing that was called in the North gradual abolition, which wasn't, uh, the hookup there was the question of who, who pays. And, and the ultimate answer was whites did not want to pay for black liberation. That was the answer back in the 1780s, the 1790s in the 1990s and in the 21st century, right? Nobody wants to pay 
to equalize, to socialize, to general welfare, to any of the rest. Professor Rowan, to your question about uh, reimagination, um, there is a need, I, I, I would argue that much of black protest over time has been a push to have America reimagine itself and to reimagine black people and also to have black people reimagine themselves. Because you know that line about free your mind, that's, that's a truth for, for blacks as well as, as for whites. And so um, the, the historical parallel back to the abolition of slavery, I think it holds important historical lessons. The push for abolition in the antebellum period was one might say a lost cause. I mean, we're talking about a minority of a minority. Um, they get elevated historically because of the thing called the Civil War. Now, their positions are really not adopted. So if we look at current circumstances and situations, and we talk about abolition of the police, abolition of the prison system and the rest, I don't know that as a matter of negotiation, those move very far. However, I do think that the reimagining argument can push forward the argument that the resources that are being spent on quote policing need to go into mental health and other strategies for dealing with what are so thought of as social problems. I think that has a lot of purchase. I think that also back to the point <laughs> Professor Brown made, the fact that we can talk about actually reducing costs by using alternative strategies, I think that has a long way to go. Um, and I think you know, that plays over into a lot of other arenas. One of my favorites there is medical care. You know, the United States pays five times what other quote, first world nation, nations pay. You know, I think I saw something eight or 10 times the cost of prescription medication in the United States than in Canada, all right? Why? I think that if you said to the American people, we can reduce our funding by a magnitude of five times or four times or whatever, that has more resonance than coming out and saying, we need to abolish the system and, um, and start all over. Because I, I, I just don't know that that has enough practical resonance to create more immediate movement. Well, I, I just, we're at time, I do have a little pushback. I think that sometimes that kind of um, econometric rationalization of reduction in relation to prisons or war or anything else, it often leads to kind of ledger manipulation, like <laughs> where, you know, we've seen what abolition calls have done in a particular kind of way um, with Minneapolis acutely, right? Um, you know, <laughs> Minneapolis is embracing the kind of political rhetoric of the demand of abolition through reducing budget, but then is increasing the budget right behind that and actually never reduced its budget if you look at it in percentage to the overall budget, right? So I think there's a danger in that kind of, um, I think the the beauty of abolition and in its historical resonance was its out thereness. It was the fact that it wasn't mainstream. Civil rights is similarly the case. That's a small percentage of people who are organized to do transformative work. Young people, other vulnerables who organize um, in those kinds of ways. And I think abolition, what abolition demands, is a kind of centering of the the reality that a prison or many other kinds of cognate um, infrastructures, co um, you know, the border, the border facility and all of these are not solutions for any of the problems that they stand over, right? And so abolition demands a reimagining through, through the actual literal, <laughs> we need to, to remove this system from 
the kind of current order. And I think, you know, prisons, to my own question at the beginning, I think prisons are environmental catastrophes. Prisons are a lot of things, right? So we can, and they certainly don't, prisons and kind of mass and mass policing don't um, don't kind of establish new relations. And I think the demand of what the histories that you all have been talking about are those radical out there positions that come forward out of abolition. It was uh, it was unreasonable to demand abolition in the antebellum period. And that's the reason that we need to make what's considered a, an unreasonable demand in our present. Um, I think I want to um, thank our um, wonderful panelists, the organizers at ABA um, for this really um, fascinating talk. Um, I'm no legal historian and I've been here just jotting notes. So I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate you all as I even face the classroom and have to think about what this means in this moment. Um, I, again, I, I also wanna thank our, again, our attendees. Thank you so much for coming. And again, check out um, the ABA's um, website for more future programming and other information. Um, and again, thanks so much